Good evening, everybody. We welcome you to this Good Friday evening service. Uh, because of the stormy weather here, it is getting dark early, sort of appropriate for this day. It's a time to reflect on the passion narratives, and this is what we will be doing, going basically through the, the fourth gospel. And I thank the lay readers who are participating in the service this evening. May we worship God. The grace of our sovereign Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. From More Voices, number 76, If I Have Been the Source of Pain.
Tonight we recall the shadows that at times cover this world. Not shadows from the sun, but shadows against the weight of the sun. We recall the violence of oppression and you, a God who hears the suffering of the people and promises to act. We recall the night of blood marking on the doorposts when the Hebrew people observed a God-commanded curfew while the messenger of death passed over the land of the pharaohs. Tonight we recall, O Christ, how you offered a way out of fear, hatred, and violence. You were accused of clamoring after power, yet you said that your realm was not bound by earthly boundaries. Symbolically, tonight we take to the darkened street where we deny you, abandon you, and watch your suffering from a distance. Beyond our shadowed ways, you loved those who were persecuting you, and forgive those who would crucify you. Dying in our evil embrace, you bring your life into our death, that we might be offered the hope of life beyond death, that we might not be alone. Tonight, we are still homebound and on our own to prevent the spread of a virus. Tonight, as we worship as a community, we are safe in our homes when people in the Ukraine and other places are not. Tonight, we proclaim your abiding love that goes beyond any earthly power's attempt to control in a world where Caesars and Pharaohs still build their monuments with the blood of the oppressed. Christ promoted a love that conquered all fear as much as it conquers death.
remember and mourn. We will now go through the readings from the fourth gospel of the Passion. They will be accompanied by only four works of art, Western art, but four symbolic with the First Nations in this land, the four directions of the compass, the four gospels of our tradition, but also in Asian culture, the character for the number four is similar to she, death. Why, if you had the number four in an address that would not be auspicious, where eight would be blessed. So death, our treatment of First Nations, the four gospels that proclaim the message of the church born this night, not Easter sunrise. As we hear first the shadow of betrayal. The shadow of betrayal from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priest and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, for whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, for whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let this man go. This one to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Marcus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? We see that reading in this fresco by Giotto da Bordone in the Scrovegni Chapel in Padua sometimes called the arena chapel because it was built on the site of an ancient Roman arena. How appropriate. And in these magnificent frescoes from 1306, we have the beginning of Renaissance imagery of like, like people. As you have the encounter of evil represented by Judas encountering good represented by Jesus. It is just evening. Some torches are lit as we heard in the reading. Some are yet to be lit. There are batons, swords, and you have a compilation of gospel narratives. We heard of Peter, who you can tell the halo to the left of Jesus, cutting off the ear. But we notice that apostles, it's easy to tell apostles and paintings of this period, they have halos along with Jesus. But Judas has lost his halo. They are pointing, they're the central figures around which the vortex of the wheel of the torches and batons and swords rage. 
and yet the image is still and peaceful. Jesus is still. He receives the act of embrace and betrayal of Judas in the form of a kiss. Betrayal in the act of intimacy. In the act of friendship. In the act of togetherness. This is human experience. This is the struggle that good and evil still encountered this day. Those who do dark deeds under the auspices of good or the blessings of church. But we have another fascinating image in this fresco. We have Peter cutting off the ear. We have the torches. We have the kiss, we have the soldiers, we have the high priest and his attendants, but we have something strange in that void between the grouping of Jesus and where the high priest is. We have the shofar. Why the shofar? Well, Padua, a university town, and not far from Venice, a town that historically had a large Jewish community, maybe there was some awareness of a significance. Jewish sages, one in the 10th century, Sadia Gaon, listed 10 major times and reasons for blowing the shofar, each with a scriptural basis. The creation of the world. The beginning of the new year. The Mount Sinai experience. The inspiring words of the prophets. The destruction of the holy temple. The binding of Isaac. They also wrote that its hearing should increase and arouse in us fear and awe of God Almighty. Fear and awe for the day of judgment. Belief in the future ingathering of the exiles and the ultimate redemption. And inspire a yearning for it. And lastly, belief in the future resurrection of the dead. The next reading. The shadow of the agony of spirit. It's Gethsemane. Oh dear, I did unmute. And he said to the disciples, sit here while uh, while I go over there and pray, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he took himself on the, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he found, came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heady, heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, 
Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? There are images of that scene, a famous one by Gauguin. But I thought tonight to do something different. And so we turn to The Crouching Woman from 1902 by Pablo Picasso, now permanently housed in an art gallery in Kyoto, Japan. He brings to mind the knowledge of suffering that the Japanese people experienced, even though their military were incredibly cruel and violent. But innocence, suffering, and others, and the experience of loneliness and isolation and feeling abandonment we have here in this painting. Blue, the traditional color of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The traditional color also of loneliness and solitude. And this woman reminiscent of a Rodin sculpture that Picasso knew has a forlorn look to her. She has a white veil and a blue cloak again images of Mary. But her loneliness is other. Picasso chose many of his models for this period from a hospital, the Hospital of Saint Lazare in Paris. It was a place where the street workers went under arrest but many suffering from venereal disease. They wore different colored bonnets to tell them apart. Regularly imprisoned poor people and those who were being not only poor, but shunned. They occupied many of the paintings of Picasso and Toulouse-Lautrec and the example of turning the religious symbol upside down. Now you may say that is perhaps inappropriate for this evening service. And yet what we hear this evening, as we heard in our lectures in the Thursday morning group about St. Paul and initial anger at the people of the way, the followers of Jesus, because how could the Messiah be accursed by being hung on a tree, when to be hung on a tree, a tree was a sign of complete abandonment by God? And so the crouching woman stands for all who are marginalized and suffering, particularly historic suffering of women. The women who could only live by working the streets were shunned. And the painters paid some small amount that went to their upkeep. It was charity that kept them existing to their death. But those who had put them, who used them, who took the metro to reach that part of the city under the gaslight, they were not punished. Uh, they were not shunned. Uh, they all died, those who required diseases, of undisclosed brief illnesses. Christ still is present in suffering, in loneliness, in solitude, and in pain. The next reading. The Shadow of Denial. This is from John 18, 15 to 27. Simon Peter, 
and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of his, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said what to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the, the high priest? And Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas, now Annas was the uh, high priest at the time. Annas sent him bound, bound him, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And I need a little aside here because Caiaphas, it seems, was Annas's son-in-law and they are thought to have shared the power, giving a reason to talk uh, in the scriptures about both of them as the high priest. So Annas has sent Jesus to Caiaphas. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. one of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. paintings we see this evening all are somber. They happen in the shadows. This painting is the last painting by Caravaggio, painted in Rome in 1610. In July of that year, he is murdered. It is simple. Three characters. The symbolism of three, Trinity, of blessedness, the three denials that Peter engages in. You have the soldier pointing with one finger, the, or rather the woman pointing with one finger, the soldier pointing with two, hence referring to the three denials. And Peter with a gesture inwards. It's interesting if you know Italian, even if you don't and you go to Italy, you don't have to know the language to figure out what they're saying. You watch the gestures. That inward gesture, sono io, is it me? I don't know him. 
by that passage where you see uh, wrong begets wrong. It's interesting in John's gospel. It's the slave was also related to the one that Peter had cut the ears off, hadn't forgotten. So she asked the question, knowing the answer. I was once told that's the tactics of a good lawyer to ask a question that you already know the answer to. But here, this happens in shadows. You can see just the bit of the flame. The flame isn't bright. The light is just raking across the surface. The soldier gleaming off the armor, gleaming off the angered face of the woman and hitting the forebrow of Peter and his hands in an act of betrayal. We are called to see ourselves in the three present. When do we use what we use for not good intentions, knowing what we know? When do we see ourselves as the police, the authorities, the ones who should regulate? And when are we, when we feel threatened or isolated, do we deny that we also know this man? The shadows of accusation. Reading from John 18, 28 to 19, Verse 16, then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The religious authorities replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the religious authorities again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for, for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. 
they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. From Voices United, hymn number 149, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. shadow of crucifixion and humiliation. John 19, 16b to 27. Then he handed him over to them, to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, 
I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes amongst themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. How could we have this evening in the Protestant service without Rembrandt van Heijn? This Rembrandt deposition from the cross is located in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Kitty corner to it is a late self portrait of the painter. This painting, uh, cut down in size and reworked, is finally completed 1652. This is a very old Rembrandt. It's not the Rembrandt of the self-portrait with the jaunty cap and fur coat. Being pleased with himself and his accomplishments having come to the capital. This is not the Rembrandt uh, that King Charles of England hears about and patronizes. He's interested in this great young painter. No, this is the painter who has suffered the loss of his beloved wife, Saskia, then before the courts because of his relationship with his model, suffered the loss of his son Titus, has been impoverished, no longer receiving the commissions. An artist who increasingly associates himself not with the good Protestant burghers of the city, but the Jewish community. And so we have this dramatic image where Joseph of Arimathea supports the dead body of Jesus. This is not the heroic Rubens crucifixion with the bodybuilder Christ. It's an old body an emaciated body, a tortured body, a crucified body, a pierced body, a dead body. The light, as it's now just dusk as we see in the background and the lights of the city behind, Lights not only Joseph and Jesus, but also Mary as she swoons. An old mother echoing the dropped arm of Jesus 
echoing the pain of bearing these things. It is the story of a mother whose son goes before her. It is the story of human suffering. The story of taking the body down in the darkness, removing it to a tomb that is not his own. And yet it's the story of the bright light of God that is present even there, even in this experience. And again, I remind us that this is the place of the birth of the church, according to the fourth gospel. The next reading. The shadow of death. Reading from John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. For more from Voices United, hymn 145, O Sacred Head, Sore Wounded.
the shadow of burial. Reading from John chapter 19, verses 31 to 42. Since it was the day of preparation, the faithful did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came back and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the religious, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, 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 o
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.